Welcome to the Mother's Day celebration series. Amen. Um, I just want to celebrate the mothers here. I appreciate each and every one of you. And I pray that the Lord will bless you. The Lord will make his face shine upon you guys. The Lord will be gracious to you. He will favor you. I've been praying for every mother here today. And I just want to say it is your time. It is your time. The set time to favor you has come. Amen. And I celebrate the men that are here as well, the husbands, the fathers. You guys are welcome. Welcome to Communion House. This is a house of prayers. Amen. And a house of testimonies. You know, God has been giving us amazing, mind-blowing testimonies. I call it unusual testimonies. Amen. 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 You guys are going to wake up. Today, I am bringing the word. <laughs> Come on. You know. And so, when I'm doing that, you're going to preach alongside with me. Amen. Praise God. Uh, today, I just want to take this time to celebrate my husband, Pastor Moses. Um, I thank God for your life. You know, this is the time I embarrass my husband. <laughs> he doesn't like me to do this, but you know, I'm a woman of honor. And so I have to lead by example. You know, so God has called us to honor um, the man of God in our life, to honor her husbands, to be submissive. And so I do that unashamedly. <laughs> you know, so I am proud to say I am a submissive wife. Amen. And so I just want to celebrate you. Pastor Moses, thank you. Thank you for um, encouraging me and pushing me to use my gift. You know, sometimes when I share things with him, he'll be like, you need to share that. I'm like, uh-uh, I'm just sharing with you. You know, we were like, no, that's wisdom. People need to hear it, you know, and he would encourage me to use my gift. And I just want to celebrate you today and say thank you. And um, the Lord showed me a vision and the Lord said, um, and thank God Anita went ahead to do that. We are still going to do that at the end of the service today. The Lord said, I want my daughters to come on the altar. This is what I saw. I, um, I saw women, um, they came to the altar and the Lord said, this is the time I want you to dedicate your children, dedicate your grandchildren, because whatever God does is not for you alone, it's for generations. And so that's how God deals with us. And then God showed me that. And he said, I want my daughters to come here to the others and rededicate their children and make a covenant with me and say, I put my child before you today. Every time you remember that child, just know that you have brought that child to the altar. They have no choice. They're going to come back. <laughs> you know, if they want to go astray, <laughs> you will say, no, you can't go astray. You are not one of them that will go astray because I have put you on the altar. That is your confidence. This is what we are going to be doing later tonight. And so I shared that with my husband and I said, this is what I saw. And I had to choose the time and the logistics. And Pastor Moses said, oh, you can do the Mother Day's weekend service. You guys can have the service. And so this is why I want to honor you, you know, for being um, supportive. Whatever women will want to do, it will say, yes, you guys go ahead. You have my support. And he's going to come and pray for us later today. And so... I'm here today just to encourage us, you know, and say this is a this is what God wants us to do. And for the men that are here, you might be thinking, oh, it's just Mother's Day service. You're gonna have a word from God. The Lord will speak to you. So to, tonight, as we go to the word now, I want you to lift up your voice and say, Father, speak to me. I ask for a visitation. Lord, give me understanding. Lord, as I bring your word tonight, oh Lord, I pray that you increase while I decrease in the name of Jesus. Let it be your word. Let it be transforming words in the mighty name of Jesus. Lacus Italiana. Oh Lord, I pray tonight. Let the words, oh God, let it be words that will heal. Let it be words that will give us direction. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, I'm going to be reading from the Bible tonight. 
And I just want to say this, because sometimes, you know, we go on Instagram and you see, you know, some random person will tell you, oh, you can have roaches in the morning and then you lose weight in the next two weeks. And then you will find people start to do that, right? You will see all those people come online and they give you suggestions and, you know, you go and do the suggestion. You don't even know if it's going to work or not. But I'm here, I'm bringing the word of God from the scriptures. If it doesn't work, come to me, come and ask me. Like, Rosemary, those scriptures you said didn't work for me, but I trust my God that it's going to work. And this has actually happened to me about two weeks ago. Someone called me. I said, oh, Pastor Rosemary, ah, you said we should honor our mother. I'm done. I've done it. It's not working. I said, uh-uh. <laughs> First of all, do you believe in God? She said, yes. I said, let's go back to the scriptures. You see, I said, I didn't say honor your mother and father. The word of God said, honor your mother and your father so that it will be well with you and your days will be long. It is the word of God in Ephesians 6. And so I always, if you know me, this is one of my favorite scriptures that I always tell. Teach your kids to honor you so that it will be well with them and their days will be long. No matter how, how old you become, you must honor your parents. You must honor your father and your mother. Those are the mysteries. Those are, this is why you see what's happening in this generation. You're thinking, what's going on in this generation? Dishonor. This honor is what's going on in this generation. The children are now parenting us. Instead of us parenting our children. And so this is why God is calling mothers. He wants to equip us to take our generation back. To bring them back to Christ on how to do things. God is the one that created us. God is the one that gave us the, the blueprint of how to do things. And so yesterday I, I took my son to um, his orchestra concert. And as we were coming, it was like, oh, um, we were going into a conversation and he was talking about um, the LGBTQ, FRGHQ, whatever alphabets. Amen. <laughs> and he said, why are you parents always blaming the young people? I'm like, well, when we train you guys, you don't listen. Do you know what my son said? My son said, I blame the parent. He's 14 year old. He said, it's bad parenting. If your child is not listening to you, you must make them listen to you. But you parents are blaming we, the children, and the children are blaming the parents. You see, that's what the enemy wants. He wants us to be playing that game, that mind game, blaming, blaming each other. But when we go back to what the scripture says, we will, we will do things right. Amen. And so tonight, this is why I said that. I'm reading from the scriptures because God created us. Okay, and the word of God says in Hebrews eleven six, it is impossible to please God without faith. So I want you, to, your faith, to rise and believe that God is real. It's not negotiable. God is real. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. God is real. Let's stop pretending. Life is spiritual. And so we're going to be reading scriptures here so you'll see what's happening in the world that it happens first in the scripture. First, it happens first in the spirit realm before you begin to see the physical manifestation of it. We have to let people know that God is real. If you are here and you're questioning your faith, listen, I'm telling you, just look at me. I'm not that random woman on, on Instagram because, you know, people will follow influences and follow what people say on the pulpits, even though you have to be careful these days. The other day, my husband was to was giving me this story how some pastors would say, Jesus is a stripper. Pastor, why don't you tell yourself the truth? Not my pastor. You see, on this puppy, this is why we encourage you to have a relationship with Jesus himself. And the pulpit is not enough to feed you. You have to go back to the word. I'm dropping ahead of myself. But you know, the pastor was saying, oh, Jesus will strip you off of your flesh, strip you off. Yeah. It, it would do that. But the scripture does, did not call him Jesus is a stripper. 
This is why you have to go back to the Word of God. This is why we have to read the Bible. If you don't have the Bible with you tonight, if you don't have a Bible on your phone, it's not a smartphone. A smartphone is the one that you can use to glorify God. A smartphone is a phone that can set your alarm to wake you up to pray. That's a smartphone. If you have a phone and you don't have a Bible downloaded on it, download it right now. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So this is, let's go from the book of the beginning, the book of Genesis. Um, this is where man fell. Genesis 3 verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Oh, we have a powerful revelation on this. If you're not a member of communion house, you want to come back next week. Pastor taught us this. He said, you know, God came to um, Adam and Eve and said, where are you? Where are you? And when they answered, God was like, who told you that? I didn't tell you you were naked. Who told you? The things that you are believing, who told you? Is it your past that is telling you stuff? Is it even your mother that is telling you stuff? Who told you? The things that you are believing that does not glorify God, who told you? All right, so in verse 10, it says, So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you hidden, eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman, <laughs> the woman who, <laughs> see, sometimes, okay, let me, let me just, let me read this. <laughs> so then the man said the woman whom you gave to me, to be with me she gave me of the tree and I ate <laughs> should I say it <laughs> you see sometimes you see let me before I say it let me go to verse 12 you know <laughs> then the man said the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. In verse 13, that the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. See, the difference between male and female, okay? I, I don't bash men at all. You will never find me talking bad about men, you know, because I have a great husband. The people who you see who bash men is either they don't have a great husband or they've been heartbroken by men or they don't have a great father. And so what's going to come out of it is, oh, all men are scum, all men are scam, whatever names they say. But the, they, they, so many differences between male and female. Women, we are very relational. We are very nurturing, right? And so when God came to them, when God came to Adam, he said, Adam, what have you done? And I was like, mm -mm, God, it's not me. It's the woman you gave me. It's Rosemary, not me. <laughs> it's not Rosemary. Well, you know, Adam was like, it's not me. It's the woman you gave me. And God turned to the woman and said, what have you done? And the woman truly will wrestle not against flesh and blood. The woman knew it wasn't her. The woman knew I'm not going to blame my husband because when you read in the book of Timothy, he said Adam was there and he was not deceived. You see, so Adam was there when they were eating the fruit. He wasn't deceived. He could have said, stop it. He could have said, don't do that. Because he knew the instructions anyway, but he kept quiet. And let me say this to married women, because sometimes your husband wants to correct you, but your husband knows the way you will react. Then he will not be quiet like, I don't want trouble. Let me know, man, if I tell man really that I don't do this, she'll start giving me attitude. I don't want the attitude. You see, this is why when you see your husband being like an Adam, you start to pray for him. You see, when he starts to blame and say, no, 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 it's not me. Because when you see Jesus, when Jesus came, Jesus didn't blame anybody. He came to save. That is the second Adam. And so Adam was quick to say, mm -mm, God, it's that woman you gave me. You see? And so I see people try to criticize Eve. Oh, when we get to heaven, oh, I'm going to ask her, why did she put her in this mess? I don't. 
I don't criticize her. Because not all the instructions God has given me that I'm obeying. And so before you go and blame somebody else, are you obeying God 100%? Before you say, oh Eve, okay, Eve has done it and God has sent Jesus to save you. Are you following Jesus' instruction 100%? We are still being like Eve. By the grace of God, we ask for his mercies every day. Like God, have mercy on me. Amen. And so Eve exposed the enemy. This is why the enemy is after you, women. This is why the enemy brings all oh, um, bitterness, anger, offense. That's why because of our nature, the enemy will use that against you. It will want to poison your heart. It brings fear into you. It makes you think like you are worthless. That's why you say, oh, you are beautiful. Listen, look in the mirror yourself and tell yourself, I am beautiful. You don't need anyone to come and tell you you are beautiful. God made you. Whatever God makes is beautiful. Don't put the pressure on your husband. Don't put the pressure on your children. Oh, you didn't tell me I'm beautiful. <laughs> you know, I was reading a post this week and the lady said, um, the lady, it was an anonymous post on Facebook and the lady said, oh, I don't feel beautiful anymore. My husband even said it. <laughs> my husband, I just had a baby and now this is my second child and I don't feel beautiful anymore. My husband is complaining, you know, I need to change my wardrobe. <laughs> Listen, if you are a Christian or if you are a believer with fruits, go ask for advice from your fellow believers. Don't go outside people who don't believe in God. Do you know that innocent post she made? She got a divorce lawyer. Do you know that innocent post she made? She got a therapist. Do you know they were telling her, oh, leave him. Oh, it's not worth it. Tell him to get out. Some people that are not even happy at their home. You see, they are behind the keyboard. Just giving instructions, just giving advice that they are not applying to their own self. And this is why I always tell you, women, if you have problem, look for a Christian that has fruits, that can advise you according to the word of God. If you don't feel beautiful, go back to the word yourself. Go and look at it. When God created you, what did God say? He created you when he said in Genesis 2.18, he called you a helper. He called you a helper. God looked at you. God, all to, up until then, everything God was creating, he said it was good. It was, when he created man, uh -uh, he said no. Until God created you, that was when God could rest. And he said you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's who you are. <laughs> Believe in yourself. Who told you? That you don't look good. Who told you? You are not a good mother. Who told you that? You know what a good mother is? Huh, the one that has been to the labor room. Have you been to the labor room? Have you seen the blood splash on the floor? Have you, have you seen that? Oh, have you guys seen videos on the internet? When they tried for men to have period pains. How they couldn't cope. That's to tell you. Yeah, just level one. And they couldn't do it. But as a woman, you push that one, two, three, four. You are a good mother. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Praise the Lord. See, and, God, and in verse 14, he says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And this is where the real problem is. Verse 15, Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. <laughs> Did you catch that? Your seed, your seed shall bruise his head. God said, I will put enmity between the two of you. Satan is not your friend. Is your enemy. And what does enemy do? They don't play with you. It's how to steal, kill, and destroy you. It's out for your seed. It's out to destroy your seed. 
You think Satan will sit down? He's, he's very proud. That was how he fell. You see? And so tonight, I want you to know this. It's a spiritual warfare. This is where it started from. When God made this declaration, Satan was like, yes, game on. Game on. Your seed will bruise his head. Your seed. Your seed. Your children. Your seed. Your children will bruise his head. And in Luke 10, so now, that seed was Jesus that came. And this is what Jesus said in Luke 10, 19. He said, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. <laughs> Did you catch that? No, you didn't. <laughs> if you catch it, you'll be jumping on your feet. This is bothering me. <laughs> Look what it says. Luke 10, 19. Jesus is saying, Behold, I have given you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. And over all, not just few, he says over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. You know, for a long time, someone was asking me, oh, when is this war going to end? I said, until you receive the crown of glory. The battle is on. And Jesus is letting you know that I have given you the authority to fight this. I have given you the power. This is why I came. So that you can fight the enemy. He has given it to you. We are at war. We have to recognize that. That we are at war. It's no longer business as usual. I know this is not the type of Mother's Day uh, message you want to hear. But this is the truth right here. Do you have a burden right now? Do you see what's going on out there? Oh, if you joined the call last week, five-year-old in kindergarten, two girls, pants down, in schools, in schools, eight-year-old, they are already talking about them being lesbians. We are at war. Don't be fooled and say, oh, that's happening in private. Uh, those, that's happening in public school. It's happening everywhere. Don't be fooled and say, I send my children to Christian school. My friend, she's 43 years old. She told me, she said, oh, <laughs> Rosemary, you know, our parents sent us to Christian school thinking they were giving us the best. But while I was there, that was where I learned drugs. That was where I learned immorality. He said, she said to me, you know why? Because our parents have money. And so we have access to things. We had access to the internet. So don't be fooled and saying, oh, I'll just send my children, you know. Because I, I see some people, they can't even afford to, to send their children to private schools. And they are just trying, working so hard, all their money, so that their children will not be corrupt. No, that's not how it is. It's a spiritual battle. And you, when it's a spiritual battle, you fight it on your knees. When it's a spiritual battle, you confront that Goliath. Not by saying, oh, I'm going to take TikTok away from them. I'm going to take YouTube away from them. Are you going to take the people they relate to away from them? You can't do that. So you have to teach your children. This is why God has called us. For that reminder, our children are supposed to answer the enemy at the gates. Are we even training them to answer the enemies at the gates? It's time for us to wake up, mom. So, that's all. Come with me. Exodus. Oh, Exodus chapter 1. <laughs> Exodus. We're going to read the scriptures today. So that you go home and you meditate on the scriptures, guys. Exodus 1. Oh, oh my God, it's a long read. How much time do I have? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's start from verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, 
The people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. And so go up out of the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. <laughs> And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. They set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. What is afflicting your children? <laughs> so this is talking about Pharaoh. In verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in the dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew wives, midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded him, but saved the male children alive. <clears throat> did you read that? If he's his son, what does his son represent? Pharaoh is still alive. Pharaoh is not a king in Egypt. Pharaoh is a principality. Pharaoh is a spirit. What does your son represent? Your son represents your legacy. Your son represents your strength. What does your son represent? Pharaoh is still out for your seed. He said if he's a male child, kill it. But the midwives, are you going to be a midwife that you will save those sons? Are you going to be a midwife that you will cooperate with God and say, not on my watch? This is what Moses' mom did, Jochebed. We talked about Jochebed last week. This is what she did. She said, Pharaoh, you can kill any other child, but not my child. God wants you to make that decision and say, what does that Pharaoh represent? Depression. It's killing the children. Cancer. It's killing the children. That's Pharaoh. Immorality. It's killing the children. That is Pharaoh. God is calling out midwives that will partner with him. Midwives that will say, not on my watch. I will not let this die. Not on my watch. I make that decision. I want you to make that decision. I say, not on my watch. You know, another thing that can destroy Pharaoh in your family, in your household. I want to read, if you will catch this, <laughs> Exodus 8.1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, First says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. <laughs> Did you catch that? You want to destroy Pharaoh, serve God. He said, let my people go that they may serve me. And if you want to destroy Pharaoh in your life, you have to serve God with your whole life. You can't be in a church and you're not serving God with everything you have. With your gift, with your talents, you, you are not serving God. And you want God to destroy Pharaoh for you? No. In some places it says, let my people go that they may worship me. This is why we don't joke, we worship here. This is why you see us on our knees, on our face, we worship God. He's looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. 
If you want God to, de to defend you, why should God save you from Pharaoh? If you are not going to worship him. Why should God save you from Pharaoh? Think about it. He's a just God. I know he's a loving God. <laughs> All the motivational speakers, oh, God is loving. He's not going to destroy you. If you don't listen, you will be destroyed. <laughs> I know. When pastor will say, Rosemary, be nice when you get up there. This is my nicest. <laughs> and um, when you check the fruits of the spirit, there is no niceness there. You know, we should come to a point in our life when you come to church. Don't just look, to look for the hype message. Look for a message that will challenge you. That you will go home. You will go home and read your Bible and study it yourself. I say, what is this Pharaoh in my household? Pharaoh that wants to destroy generations. Because that's what men represent. He wants to destroy generations. What is that thing? Is it high blood pressure? In your family, kick it out. Is it diabetes? That is Pharaoh. Don't settle for it. Because God has given you the power and the authority to say no. Not on my watch. Out. Not on my watch. Out. You know, I had the testimony of this woman. Um, they were going and they had an accident, a group of them from church, and they had an accident. And they came to tell the pastor and said, Oh, this lady survived it. You know, let's say Rosemary. Because you see why I said Rosemary. And they said, This lady survived this accident. Wow, you know, the other ones that they died. You know what the pastor said? The woman said, the pastor said, oh, she can't die. Who will clean the sanctuary? Did you catch that? She can't die. Who will clean the sanctuary? You see, that means that that woman, she has something before God. And God said, no, Satan, you can't touch this one. She's cleaning the sanctuary for me. Rosemary can't die. Because why? She's cooking rice every Tuesday. Rosemary can't die because she's hot. It's a city for people who are coming in the house. Rosemary can't die because I have my children that are going to answer the enemies at the gate. Rosemary can't die when people drop the, when, when they left things and said, no, they were not doing it anymore with communion now. Rosemary stood up and said, it's okay. I know the vision God gave my husband. I am here. Rosemary cannot die. Yeah. What is speaking for you at the altar? What do you have? What service are you giving to God? That is speaking. This is what I told you be this morning. I said you can't die. When I'm not able to pick my children at the bus stop, B will be there. You can't die. She is serving. You see, the enemy wants to mess with her mind. And this morning we told her, girl, it's not your time. You are not dying. We decreed over her. We say it confidently. It's not words of encouragement. We know this. B, I said to her, you can't die. Who's going who's, who's gonna to be giving my children gifts? No, you can't die. I'm not kidding you guys. B, she doesn't mean it. She doesn't miss it. My husband's gift, birthday, Father's Day, she is a great neighbor. And for me, for my sake, she can't die. Not on my watch. So when she was sharing her testimony, I was removed. I was like... You can't have cancer. Not on my watch. What is speaking? What's serving? Serve God. He said, the Lord spoke to Moses. Go to Pharaoh and say to him, let my people go that they may serve me. This is how you deal with Pharaoh. You serve the Lord with your whole heart. With everything that you have. Praise the Lord. Finally, let's look at a woman who didn't keep quiet for her child's destiny. This woman was written in Matthew 1 verse 6. 
<laughs> Bathsheba. Woo! This is another example of moms that I learned from in the scripture. You must find people you learn from in the word of God. You must look and say, oh, I learned from Jochebed, a woman of faith and confidence in God. Now we go to 1 Kings chapter 1. Now King David was old, advanced in, in years, and they put covers on him, but he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said to him, let a young woman, a virgin, be sought for our Lord, the king, and let her stand before the king and let her care for him, and let her lie in your bosom. That our Lord the King may be warm. So they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. The young woman was very lovely and she cared for the king and served him, but the king did not know her. Then Adonijah, the son of Agith, exalted himself, <laughs> saying, I will be king and prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. <laughs> Let me read that again. Then Adonijah, the son of Agif, Agif, exalted himself saying, I will be king. Does that sound familiar? Satan, Lucifer, I will exalt myself. That's what Lucifer was saying. I will ascend to the throne. I, I, I. The ministry of the devil. When you're always thinking about yourself. That's the ministry of Satan. Ah, it's all about me. My feelings. I'm hurt. Church hurt. We kick that demon out of this place in the name of Jesus. Hmm. And in verse 6, and his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, why have you done so? He was also very good looking. <laughs> he, when the Bible says you're good looking, in how we say Peter was good looking. You know, women like bad boys. You see? And look how, how they describe Adon Adonijah. He said he was very good looking. His mother had born him after Absalom. And um, because of time, let me move. But, in verse 8, But Zadok the priest, Beniah the son of Jehuida, Nathan the prophet, Shimei, Rhea, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. When you are being crowned a king, the priest must be there. The prophet must be there. But look at what he was doing. He knows it's not his rightful position. You see, it was his wife. He was the fourth son. But the father had already said Solomon was going to be a king. So he was like, I'm taking it by force. No, you have to be crowned. You don't take things like that by force. And Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the stone of Zeloth, which is by Enrogo, he also invited his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants, but he did not invite Nathan, the prophet, <laughs> Beniah, the mighty man, or Solomon, his brother. It gets interesting in verse 11. So Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Agif, has become king, and David, our Lord, does not know it? A prophet spoke to Bathsheba. A prophet spoke to Bathsheba. Who is looking out for you? Who is looking out for you and your children? Are you planted somewhere that someone can look out for you and your children? I say, this child, it's time they start driving. This child, do you have them in extra activities? This child, who is looking out for you and your children? This, I want to do it by myself. It's not going to work. See, the prophet spoke to Bathsheba. Have you not heard? Have you not heard? I'm asking tonight. Have you not heard that immorality is the order of the day? Have you not heard 
that the, uh, that the, the, the suicide rates have gone up with teenagers. Have you not heard that there is a burden for children now? Have you not heard? This is the prophet telling Bathsheba and this is the voice I'm coming with you mothers and fathers. Have you not heard? We cannot be ignorant at this time. Have you not heard what children are doing these days? They don't say, my children are good. No. You have to have a burden for souls. Have you not heard that souls are perishing? Have you not heard that people are marrying trees now? You guys, you haven't seen that? A woman married a tree said, this is my husband now. This is, the, this is the evil going on in the world. And when I look at people fighting governments to do it, they don't have the power. The church has the power to do it. Don't go and fight physical battles when you haven't done your spiritual battle. It's not going to work. Don't be waiting for the government. Oh, they have to pass this law. When they pass the law, what happens? People's hearts will change. Have you not heard? This is what God is asking you. Have you not heard what's going on in the world? Have you not heard the evil happening now? And in verse 12, it says, Come, please let me give you, let me, let me now give you advice that you may save your whole life and the life of your son. Come, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and that of your son. God is very strong on parenting because whatever takes your child out is taking you out. This is why the prophet was telling Bathsheba, he said, come. So that you may save your whole life. Don't be there. Don't let your children die in front of you. Come. Let me show you. And tonight I want to have three um, characteristics of eagles. We always say, oh, I'm a mama bear. Don't just be a mama bear. Be a mama eagle. Yeah. Don't just say, oh, I'm a mama bear. I care. I nurture. I nurture mine too. But we have got to be mama eagle. Eagles fly alone at high altitude. The word of God says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. They fly alone. You need your alone time with God. As a mother, you need your alone time with God. You make time to eat. You make time to, to, to drink. You make time to go to the gym. Do you make time for God? Make that your priority. That's how to be a mama eagle. It's easy for us to, to make time for things that don't even profit us. You make time to go to work. Oh yeah, you will never be late to work. Because why? You see the physical dividend. But in the spirit realm, when you make time for God in the secret place, that's where secrets are given to sons and daughters. In the secret place. I have benefited from my alone time with God. One time my son William wasn't eating, wasn't growing well and I was in the secret place. The Lord said to me get up now. Go to Kroger. He showed me what to buy. I was blown away. He said buy this food. This is what you will eat. I got that from the secret place. From the sacred place. Make time to study the word of God. For in there you find life. People don't study the word of God anymore. This, what I've been reading to you, is from the word of God. Study the word of God. You find answers there. The word of God said, one day I found it. An ambassador brings elf. That means... If you're an ambassador, you have health. I, I'm an ambassador of God. I should have health. Yes, I represent, I represent the kingdom of God. And I bring health. Everywhere I go, I bring health. Everywhere I go, I bring healing. I started to confess that to my, myself. 
that's what you do when you get into the word of God. It will give you life. It will give you peace. When you say you are depressed, get into the word of God. The word of God is life. Read it. Meditate on it. You need your alone time as a mama legal. You need that time with God. So God can reveal secret things to you. Can your children come to you and say, Mom, I really, I really need this. Joshua's come to me many times. Mom, I want to get in the robotics competition. But the competition is high. I said, leave it to me. Let me go to the secret place. You will find favor. He said, Mom, it's over 200 students. I said, trust me. Let it be one million students. Do you want to get it? Yes. I will get it for you. Leave it to me. Let me go and pray. Let me go to my God. And many testimonies with that. Because why? I'm being a mama eagle. Can you tell your children? Leave it to me. Somebody is bullying your child or even your adult children. They say, my boss is troubling me, giving me troubles at work. Tell them, leave it to me. Let me go to the secret place and fight that battle for you. That's what we do as Mama Eagle. Say, no, eagles are fearless. Nothing shakes them. So no matter what your children want to bring, say, leave it to me. I always tell it. Don't bully my child. I don't care who you are. A teacher, a student, don't bully my child. Because I'm a mama ego. <laughs> if I tell my child, leave it to me. Even Joshua knows. He's like, mm, I don't want to tell you this. Because <laughs> you go and pray about it. And you know, I was like, don't mess with my children. I nurture them but I fight for them in the spirit realm. And that's why I've come to encourage you guys. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. He goes our vision. Finally, I'll just do this because I want us to pray for our children. Eagles have vision. Have a vision for your children. You see, the world has made children look like a burden to us now. Oh, I'm tired. I've been looking after them all day. Oh, can someone take them away from you? Nobody's taking them away from you. Yes. No one is taking the children away from you. Take care of your children. They are not a burden. They have, read Psalms 127. He said, bless is he who has them. Fall in his quiver. You are blessed. It's not, you see, what, what the world thinks blessing is, is when you are put on Forbes magazine, that's what we count as blessing. That's not blessing. According to the word of God, when you have children, you are blessed. Your children are not burdened. Look yourself and say, you are not a burden to me. When you keep looking at your children like they are burdened, they will become burdened. Oh, one, one child told me, it was last year um, into summertime. Miss Rosemary, oh, I, are you excited about summer or not? I said, oh, I'm excited. He said to me, he said, my mom is not. And I said, Why? He said to me, my mom said, oh, all the parents are going to be sad. The children will be home for, for summer break. Oh, they're going to be a problem. Oh, I said, oh, you are not a problem. I told the child, I reassured the child. And I said, my children are no problem. In fact, I don't want them to go to school. My husband is even worse. If they say, oh, the children have some, my husband said, quick, quick, go and bring them home. He doesn't even want them to go to school. You see, don't let your children be a burden like the world is telling you. They will keep bringing things that will burden you. But when you look at your children, you say, you are my joy. That child will be giving you joy. When you look at them, you say, you are my peace. That child will give you peace. But when you keep complaining and thinking they are burdens, you are the one who has that life and death in your mouth. And when you are saying that, those children will be burdened. And this is why you see when parents are, oh, they are doing this. What are they doing? 
Train up your child in the way it should go. Have a vision. Like Mama Eagle, have a vision for your children. Train up a child in the way it should go. Do you know what that means? It didn't say train up your children. Did you catch that? He said, train up your child because each child is different. Each child has his own unique abilities. Each child has his own unique gifts. This is why he said, train up your child in the way it should go. And when he grows, he will not depart from it. This is why we are covenanting them to God tonight. And say, you will not depart from it. When they try to go, it's like there is a rope tied to their neck. When they try to go, that rope brings them back. When they try to go astray, that rope says, no, 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 no. Your mom has made a covenant. Come back here. Come back into the house of the Lord. Because every day you have made that vision. What vision do you have for your children? What vision do you have? What has God shown you? If God hasn't revealed your vision, any vision concerning, ask him tonight. You see, we have so many homework that we are doing. Are you going to partner with God? You said yes. Ask the Lord, what have you called my child to be? What have you called my child for? I have done that. And I stand here to tell you, I've asked God when my children, this is why when Joshua said, oh, I want to play soccer. I was like, Joshua, you're not a soccer player. God, (laughs) you know, some people are into sports, I know. You see, but God has shown me, I can't spend how many hours do they do? They do practice, they, they have football, they have all this. I can't waste my time for that. You are, you are a kingdom financier. God has shown me you will be dividing in every senses. That's not for you. You are not a soccer player. You, oh, mom, you know me. You know moms. I got him a soccer net for Christmas. Be practicing there. You see, that's how I offer my support. But I know deep down. I said, I said, Mom, have you registered me? You don't need any registration. Just be practicing. At the, at the back of our house. Be practicing there. Ah, be practicing. You know, Joshua will be there. Uh, well, he said, Mom, I, I need those football boots. I said, Oh, yeah, I'll get it for you. Just be practicing at the back. When you finish practicing, you come back in and you talk business with your daddy. Amen. This is, this is one reason I married my husband. Let me share this secret with you, women. Single women, hello, are you here? Don't just marry somebody that will be a husband to you. Marry someone that can be a father to your children. When I saw, when I met my husband, I said, I assessed him. I said, ah, oh, before I ask God, let me even know if, if I like him myself. <laughs> let me even check him out. You see? And for me, he was very intelligent and business oriented. I said, yes, this is the type of, you know, I want to produce after this kind. You don't want to produce after someone that is lazy. You don't want to produce someone that is spending your money. Girls, are you listening? I'm looking out for you. Because I don't want you to come and say, oh, Pastor Rosemary, let's pray. Let's. Don't you want to be blessing your husband and having a prayer point all the time? So, this is why. So, when Joshua was, when God said, this is a kingdom financier, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> He's a kingdom financier. He has a businessman as his father. Praise the Lord. And I started to, ha- I started to pray him into that. Last year, was it last year? That Joshua, he, he, um, he opened this company. We didn't help him. He did the website, Insta, um, the social media pages all by himself. Oh, when I saw the website and the adverts, the, the posters he was creating, I was like, uh-huh, Kingdom Financier. I have scriptures that I pray over them that they will fulfill destiny. And so tonight, do you want to be that midwife? It's, it's prayer time. 
Do you want to be that midwife? That you want to partner with God and say, God, I am ready. I bring my children to you, Father. I am ready. And so moms, I want you to come out here. We are going to be praying. We're going to pray for our children. And use this altar as a reminder that Father tonight, no matter the age of my children, I bring them before you. Yes, my Lord and my God, I bring my children before you. Ah, I renew my covenant with you. If you haven't had a covenant, if you haven't covenanted your children before God, this is the time to do it. And say, Lord, ah, I bring my children to you. My children will serve you. Ah, Lord, I will fight for my children. Bathsheba fought for her son, Solomon. If you go down to read the scripture, you will see where, where she went to the king. And the king said to her, what do you want from me? The king of kings is asking you tonight, mothers, what do you want from the Lord? What would you have me do? What do you want? This is your opportunity. Don't let this go by you. Begin to tell the Lord and say, Father, this is my desire. I am ready. I am ready, Lord. I am ready to partner with you. I am ready to partner with you, Lord. I bring my children before you. Father, we will raise godly seeds before you, oh God. Lord, this is what you ask of us. Godly seeds, godly children. In the name of Jesus, before you can raise godly children, you have to be godly yourself. You have to be on the side of God before you can raise that godly seed say father help me I have come to ask for your help Lord, help me over each of my child. Father, give me a vision for them. Give me a vision in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. Laku, Satali, and the Lord will pray. Mothers have come as you have instructed us, O God. The blessings of obedience will rest upon mothers tonight. In the name of Jesus, Laku, Satali, Leka, Lamano, Satali, and Lima, Satali, Father, Lord. We covenant our children before you tonight. Lord, we ask, oh God, Father, Lord, that our children are taught by you, oh God. Lord, we ask for your help, oh Laku Sataliana. Zetele Moku Lamanu Sita. Hey, Kalamano, Setelebo Shataliana. Limanu Sutaleku. Mane Zetele Moku Lumanu Sata. Oh, Father, mothers are here. On your instruction, Father, we are here. On your instruction, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. We will remember this night, oh God. We will remember this night in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is good. You know, I mean, God is good. I'm going to just quickly say a couple of things um, that the Lord dropped on my heart just before this meeting, this afternoon in particular. And when I heard some of the things my wife said, it became very apparent the reason why God put those things on my heart. Um, one of them is this. The Lord led me to the woman, the Syrophoenician woman, who came to Jesus asking for healing for her child. And when you hear that the woman is a Syrophoenician woman and she's standing in front of Jesus, she has labored. Jesus was a Jewish man when he was here in the flesh and he was surrounded by Jewish men and they would not let a woman come close to their rabbi talk less of a, an alien woman. And so the woman must have done all kinds of things. So let me just encourage you, you heard my wife say that, Whatever your child requires to be someone in life will require great sacrifices from you. So make sure before you start making sacrifices, you have heard from God 
and received insight. You see what I mean? If your son wants to be a musician, don't just start paying for studio time and, and having sleepless nights waiting in the car while he's with producers and songwriters and all that good stuff if you haven't heard from God. If you do not have a vision of him being into sports, a lot, I mean, we have a lot of people here whose children are into sports. You know what it takes. Don't let it be a waste because you, if you haven't heard from God and you're just putting in all the effort, what if God has something else in mind for him? Then you would have deprived yourself of the resources and the ability to support him in what God has called him to do. As a mother, you will be the one to make the sacrifice. So make sure that you have clarity. And this is where clarity comes in. The woman was willing to fight, well, she was willing to fight for her child. And the Bible says somehow, without any explanation, because everybody at the time knew that the woman must have gone through, she must have gone through a lot to be able to stand in front of Jesus. And she said, Rabbi, this child needs healing. And Jesus was like, are you aware of the fact that I have come primarily for the Jews and then eventually for the Gentiles? I've come to save everybody, but I, I'm here first of all for the Jews. Now, many of us, if we were standing in front of Jesus and he said that, we would have just called him a racist and said, oh, you are just being, you just care about your own. You don't care about the rest of us. You can't be the savior. You know what the woman did? The woman said, I am very well aware of that. And she said, and Jesus was like, okay, so what else do you know? And the woman said, I do know that even if, no, Jesus said, what you're asking for is healing and healing is the children's meat. Healing belongs to the children. You're a stranger. I mean, I'm not committed to you at this particular time. But you know what the woman said? The woman said, I know. But I also know one thing that when the children are being fed, even the crumbs from the table can be picked up by the dogs before their time. Because in the Jewish culture of that time, you feed the children first and the dogs would have the leftover. There was no dog food and there was no dog food section in Jesus' supermarket. You understand what I mean? So the children ate the leftover and the woman was like, just the crumbs will do in this situation. And Jesus looked around at everybody and said, I have not seen faith like this in all of Israel. Women, let it be to you according to your faith. A couple of things were in operation there. I'm going to draw some of them from what my wife said. You see, this woman had faith. What is faith? Faith is when you are operating by wisdom, in understanding, and with knowledge. When you look at every instance where Jesus said to his disciples, you have little faith, or you who have no faith, it was because they do not have an understanding of what he was saying. Faith is not believing. Be believing is believing. The Bible says you need to believe, but you must also have faith. So as a mother, you must be operating with wisdom, which means not the mind of God concerning your children. You must have an understanding of the uniqueness of your child and the peculiarities of their being. And then you must fill yourself with knowledge, beginning primarily with the knowledge of the word of God. This woman knew the word of God. The Syrophoenician woman was a stranger, but she had gone and done her homework. She came prepared. Most times the reason why people's attitudes put us off, the reason why God's response puts us off is because we are not prepared for what God is going to say. We are not prepared for what people are going to say. There are times I go to pray and God says certain things and I'm like, yeah, I knew you would say that. Because he said that before. He said that to Moses. So fill yourself with the word of God. Pray for insight and then meditate on what you have heard and read of the word of God so that it replaces tradition, it replaces pop culture, it replaces unbelief, it replaces rebellion so that you can begin to operate in understanding. And the combination of wisdom, knowledge and understanding is what will give you the faith to be able to say things that will bring about promotion and progress in the lives of your children. So my wife invited me up here to pray, not to preach, but I just thought it's important to say those things. And the Lord said to me, every mother should be like the Syrophoenician woman, who is not just fighting because they have grit, who is not just fighting because they have money and resources, but they fight because they have a revelation by God. They have faith, they have understanding of how things work. 
Everything that we see in the natural begins in the spirit. The Bible says the things that are seen are a function of the unseen and the worlds that are tangible are made from the intangible. So before you do anything in the natural, before you spend a dollar to buy your son or child a gaming computer, have you wrestled in the spirit for their attention before you give things to them? Because if we haven't committed them to God in the realm of the spirit, they will be taken over by things in the natural, not on your watch. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When my wife came to me and she told me, she said, the Lord is put on my heart to bring women together to possess the promises that are in the word of God. The Lord has brought me to bring women together for kingdom advancements, particularly in the lives of their children. I was like, oh, that is exciting. That is great. She said, but the Lord said, the name will come from you. So I had to remind my wife. I said, have you forgotten that it is I, the same one who is never really allowed to choose names in any business partnership that I'm in? I come up with the weirdest names. I remember there was a partnership that I was in when we first moved to Atlanta. After two meetings, one of the guys from Marietta, that's why I don't like Marietta very much, he stood up and he was like, can we just have a quick vote that whenever we have to choose names for anything within this product that Moses does not vote or make a suggestion? Because they looked at all the names that I was suggesting. They sound like biblical names and they were like, ain't nobody calling this app that? I wanted to call an app Absalom because of the name Absalom and they were like, yeah, that's it. So when she came to me, I said, the name has to come from you. I'm like, uh, you desire. She said, the Lord told me to come to you. And the moment she said that, I'm like, okay, the Lord does not ask me for things that he has not already given to me. So in that very moment, I shut my mouth and I went deep down within me. Jesus said that the scribe that is instructed in the things of God will bring from his treasures things both old and new. And I said to her, indeed, you shall be called helpers on watch. That's where the name came from. Simply because every man needs help and that primary help that you need is a woman. Oh, come on, let me say that again. Don't let any man make you feel like he's more important than you. Don't let any man make you feel like he's got it. When your man tell you, don't worry about it, I got it. Let him know that he ain't got nothing. Because the Bible says when God was making man, after he made man, he tested man's intelligence and discernment. He brought all the animals to see what he would call them. And the Bible says whatsoever he called the animals was their name. And God was like, yeah, at that level, you're a champion. But for the real assignment that I have for you, you need help. The Bible says it is not good for a man to be alone. You see the word that was translated rib. Genesis chapter 2 verse 22. The Bible says the Lord took a rib from the man. He took the, took the man's rib. Do you know that that word rib does not refer to your bone? The word rib is the word frame or support. So the Lord took that which is the man's support from him. And the moment God took it from him, do you know that that word rib is the word selah? Not selah. Selah is meditation. But the word selah means support. It means frame. And the or origin of that word is the word salah. And salah means to limp. So God's expectation is that a man who has no woman is only limping through life because his frame of support has not been found. And that is the reason why when Adam saw Eve, when he said, this is bone of my bones, the original rendition means this is the frame of my support. That was what he said. He wasn't just repeating himself by saying, oh, this is bone of my bones. No, he was saying, this is the frame of my support. And so women are that important. And so I want to encourage you, do something about what God has given to you. My wife quoted from Psalms 117 verse 9, I believe, where David says, I shall not die but live to declare the works of God. When we are committed to doing the works of God, to serving other people, to serving in the name of God, we cannot die. Even if somehow you die in your flesh, your legacy will not die. Even if somehow you are tired in your flesh, your zest will not die. Even if somehow you're frustrated in the natural, when you sleep, you'll be winning back battles in your sleep simply because a commitment that is made to do the will of God. Let me tell you something. When I was an associate pastor, I was serving with everything that I've got. And a minister came to the church where I was an associate pastor. Everybody's schedule was tight and mine was even tighter. So I called my clients 
And I'm like, I need to make this up to you, but I can't do this this week. I called people, the Bible says, blessed is that servant who uses unrighteous mammon to secure for himself eternal friendships in the kingdom. I, for, I, I was happy to forgo money. I told some of my clients, I would do that work. You don't worry about paying me as long as you let me do it next week. I cleared my schedule to serve this servant of God for a whole week, almost a whole week. I was taking him everywhere. And you know what he said to me? He looked to me and he said, the Lord revealed to me while you were running around serving me that between the ages of 11 and 13, you and your son will build something together. And after that, he will be off to the races. Between the ages of 11 and 13, pretty much everything that you see that is a digital platform for communion house, from email to website to streaming platform, he built that when he was 11 to 13. And by the time he turned 13 last year, he called us and he says, I want to show you something. He had built his own company profile and he had already chosen the date for his first training conference and he made money that covered all of the expenses and had some money left after that. I want to encourage you when God asks you to serve, it's not because God needs your service for God, it's because God needs you to seize that opportunity for service to mature and for your eyes to open to see what God has for you. Anybody who chooses to be instrumental in the lives of other people who is not just saying me, myself and I or me, myself and my children. Heaven's help will not be lacking in your affairs. And lastly, and this is what I am going to pray over you folks. I am going to pray for you that the Lord will strengthen you in the area of authority. Jesus says, I have given you the authority and you will bruise the head of the serpent. And you know in Genesis, God said, for now, your seed will bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent's serpent will bruise his heel. When Jesus came, Jesus elevated the authority. He says, you will tread, up, tread upon the serpent, the lion, the scorpion, and they will, be, they will not be able to hurt you. So we've been elevated in that authority. So I pray for you today that you will see yourself receiving and operating in the authority that Jesus has given to you to overcome the opposition that is against the generation that your children belong to. This generation that our children are growing up in is the generation of the reprobate spirit that is causing people to lose understanding of the boundaries that God has set. They no longer recognize boundaries between children and parents. They no longer recognize boundaries between male and female. They no longer recognize boundaries between what God does and what government does. They no longer recognize the authority between what they should do to take responsibility and what they should do to just have fun. But we, by the authority that we have, we can expel the reprobate mind from the lives of our children. That even though they are in this world, they will not be of the world. So I pray for you today, everybody present here, man, woman, child, mothers especially, that you will receive divine insight and consciousness to be able to operate in the authority that you have been given. To make sure that on your watch, none that has been given to you will be lost. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17. He says, of the ones that you have given to me, none shall be lost. None None of your children will be lost to suicide. None of your children will be lost to addiction. None of your children will be lost to the lust of the flesh, to the lust of the eyes, and definitely not to the lust of the flesh. None of your children will be lost to the pride of life, but they will be children that promote the legacy of grace. They will be children that seek the Lord. They will be children that change their world in the mighty name of Jesus. Let me tell you something. It is better to scream and yell in prayer than to scream and yell in pain. Shame is painful. Loss is painful. Don't wait until you have suffered those things before you allow all the zest within you to come out. Let it come out in the place of prayer. When you are consciously choosing how much you shout and when you shout. It is better to do that because God has given you that authority. And I just want to thank God for the women of this house. I want to appreciate you for such an amazing Mother's Day service. I want to celebrate my wife. And you know, I didn't know much about what was going on today. She just told me it's Mother's Day and I want you to sit there. You see what I mean? In fact, when I saw the text message in the family group today saying it's time to get ready at three o'clock, I'm like, no, this is an hour earlier than this. Yeah, because I was outside, I was in the yard. I'm like, what's going on? So I messaged, I was like, why are we so early? She said, because today we're leaving at five. We have to be at church, you know, at about 5.30. 
And I'm like, why is 6 30? She said, because we're eating today. That is how little I knew of what's going on today. And so I appreciate the fact that you would take that burden to make it happen, to make it a most amazing Mother's Day. I appreciate that very greatly. And thank you all to everybody who supported to make it great. I want to offer special thanks to Alan because I know that, you know, a lot of what my wife would have asked me to do, you stepped in and you did that, you, Manuelita, and Mace. Um, I said Mace, I like calling him Mace because his last name is Mason, but Kenyatta. You know, I appreciate you guys very greatly. Now, all that said, um, I can keep mentioning names because I know that there were people making sure that there was meat parties and all of that, people like Anita. I, I want everybody here to help me give a special round of applause to the band. Yeah. The worship was off the chain. We appreciate y'all very greatly. That worship was completely off the chain. I was just like, I was, I was seeing things and hearing things. So thank God, um, it's nine o'clock. Let us break bread. Are you happy to, for us to break bread? Okay, God is good. All right, please be seated. We're going to break bread. And for those people who are not familiar with the term breaking bread, we're having communion house. The word communion is very special to us because Jesus said as often as, often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Come on, praise the Lord. Thank you, Alan. Do this in remembrance of me. And um, the Lord said to me again to make it very clear that we are primarily spirit beings. Jesus said to the woman by the well, the woman by the well, we all know the story. She said to him, she was a Samaritan woman. She said to the Samaritan woman that a time is coming wherein you wouldn't have to come to this well, wherein you wouldn't even have to go to the mountains where your fathers prayed or go to the temples that they built by hands because God has moved on. Jesus told the woman, she, he said to her, God has moved on. He says, God is seeking true worshipers who would worship him in spirit and in truth. So if God is expecting you to worship him in spirit and in truth, and his word is the truth, that means everything that you need to please him, he has already made it available in the spirit. He doesn't expect you to parent your children or to be in partnership and agreement with your spouse by human psychology, by going for one therapy after another, by reading books. It, you are not going to do it by academic exploits or by mental abilities or by you know uh, psychological prowess you will do those things by first of all being who God has called you to be a spirit under God operating in truth so before we attack anybody in our home before you complain about anybody go first of all into the realm of the spirit and begin to deal with things rebuke imaginations that are not of God Rebuke imaginations that are not of God because the weapons of your warfare, they are not carnal, they are not natural. That's what it means. They are not carnal. They are not of the physical realm, but they are mighty through God to the pull, for the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imaginations and every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of Christ. A lot of men are dealing with all kinds of crazy ideas today. Even women are dealing with all kinds of crazy thoughts today. And... We, we, we just want to fight each other. We just want to, you know, condemn and rebuke each other without having taken time to go into the spirit to examine what may have gone wrong. To use the authority that you have to rebuke demons that may be tormenting your spouse or spirits that may be bothering your children. Let us not forget the reason why the world has gotten us repeatedly to not think about spiritual things. The reason why psychology has been magnified and therapies have been promoted over prayer is because people don't make money from you by asking you to pray. If I tell my leader, go and pray for your husband. She doesn't have to give me any money. I know people ask for money these days to even pray for you. You understand what I mean? Which is completely upside down. And it's an advantage for us because anybody who asks for money, you immediately know that they're not of the order of Christ. They are of the temple of mammon. Because the Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. And so if I'm asking for money to pray, immediately you know that I can't possibly be of God. It is not possible. You can't, Jesus says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? 
Did Jesus ever ask money from anybody? Did Apostle Paul ever ask money? Apostle Paul even said, he said, have I asked anything of you? He said, have I not become poor that you may be rich? You understand what I mean? And so we don't have to complain about people doing it. We have to be thankful to God that the devil is that shameless these days that he's allowing his servants to be that blatant. But if I ask my leader to pray, it doesn't involve money. She can just go behind closed doors and pray. People don't make money. So because people want to make money, what do they say? Oh, your husband is having this issue? You're having this issue? I have this 15-day seminar that you have to come to. Oh, you have to go and watch my pre-recorded online videos, but you have to pay me $25 for access. And so the reason why it seems as if it is no longer popular for people to pray is because people have promoted, the world system has promoted things that have been monetized. But we don't have power in those things. The real power that we have been given is in the place of prayer, in the place of intercession, in the place of worship, and in the place of genuine service to God and to others. Amen. When we do those things, we can never lose. If we do those things, it gives us access to power. And when we have power, the world becomes our playground because we're not sweating and struggling through life. We are overcoming because it's already settled in heaven. Before you take your child to that psychological program, before you start buying that drug to calm the psychology or the mentality or the behavior of your child, go to the Lord in prayer. Abandon yourself in the place of prayer. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, ask somebody who is to lay hands on you so that you can pray in tongues and pray in the Spirit because the people who are looking to take advantage of you are spending about the same amount of time preparing fake curriculums and burning incense in the room before you come so that when you come, all of the sages have already been burnt in the room and you think you're going for therapy but you are going for witchcraft you cannot allow for them to do that while you do nothing if you will spend the same amount of time and dedication to seek the God of the army of angels no devil can take advantage of you or your children let me tell you something one day Ariel came to the room in the middle of the night and she was like oh I'm afraid I just woke up from a dream I said what did you see she told me she saw sea animals large sea animals. I said they looked like dolphins and whales. I said, but they were not friendly like dolphins, were they? She said, no. She said they were coming after me. And I asked her because I needed to know what I was dealing with. So I knew we were dealing with marine spirits. And so how would I know if I have not read? How would I know if I have not studied? Because there are spirits who are trapped in the water. When Jesus was casting out the devils that were in the madman of the Gadarenes, those devils did not want to go to Sheol. They wanted to remain on the earth. And they knew that if Jesus would cast them out and send them to Sheol, they will go from the surface of the earth to the bottom of the earth. And they didn't want to go. They would rather be in the water because people still come into the water. They said, send us into the swine. When they got into the swine, the Bible says the herd of swine took this legion of demons, about 12 million of them, and took them into the waters. So there are spirits trapped in the water and they still want to trouble you from within the sea. When she told me she had that dream, I said, okay. So I rebuked the spirits and I told her to go back to sleep. She wanted to come and sleep between us on our bed. I said, no. A time is coming wherein you will be too big to come and sleep in this bed. If I don't prepare you now to be able to stand on your own, you will always need me. And so I said to her, because the Bible says train up a child in the way that they should go. So I don't have to wait until my child is 14 before he knows how to pick up the trash behind him because he needs to be an adult who is tidy. So he needs to be, begin as a child who is tidy. So I said to her, go to your room. They will bother you no more. That was the last time that she ever came saying she had a dream. Not because she's afraid to come, but because she's been sleeping peacefully. And you know what? If anything shows up, she heard me pray. She knew what I said. She knew the position that I took. It's easier for her to take that position rather than running helter-skelter. What is the summary of what I am saying past the time that you committed? The summary of what I am saying is it is time for you and I to elevate and go in the spirit where our authority truly works. There is nothing you cannot afford in the realm of the spirit. There are therapies you can't afford on earth because they're just that expensive. It's not very easy for you to just book Dr. Phil. We're talking about maybe $75,000 an hour, thereabouts. You understand what I mean? You can't even, yeah, there are some bishops that you cannot get because it's 50,000 for three hours. So why bother yourself with things that has not been given to you? 
that have not been given to you. When you have an abundance of authority that has been given to you that works even better than money. I'm not saying if you are in therapy to just pick up the phone and tell them you're not coming tomorrow. But what I am saying is this prioritize spiritual power over material and natural help. So as we break bread today in the mighty name of Jesus, Jesus said to do this in remembrance of me. When we were kids, there were meetings that we went to and they told us, if you've just sinned, you can't eat this thing. This thing is called Holy Communion. And sometimes we were like, yeah, I just told a lie on the bus. I ain't taking it. And you will feel okay with yourself because you're like, I'm being honest. But being honest doesn't mean being truthful because the truth is when you agree with God. God says, whosoever believes will not perish. When you take the blood of Jesus, it cleanses you of all sins. So I'm encouraging you, every one of us here today, don't feel like you're not qualified to eat of the Lord's body or drink of his blood because it is actually that body and that blood that can save. So today, as you take it, Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. What are we doing? We are calling all of our lives' energies and forces and all of the forces that govern life, the principalities and powers. We're calling everybody to remembrance that it was for us that Christ died so that they can mind their business and leave us alone to do the will of our Heavenly Father. Paul says, let no one trouble me going forward because now I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. His blood, his body. They are his mark. And so as you ingest the mark of the blood into your body today, as you ingest the mark of the flesh of Jesus into your body today, receive it in gratitude, receive it unto empowerment, receive it unto deliverance, receive it, receive peace, receive the combination of the blood and the body and receive joy. If you've been struggling to be joyful, that shackle is broken over your life today in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare you free to rejoice in the God of your salvation. If you've been struggling to sleep, I declare you free from worrying today in the mighty name of Jesus as you partake of the body and the blood. The Lord said to me in this very moment that there is a couple here and you're just struggling to be in agreement. It's almost as if whatever the wife says, the husband doesn't understand, whatever the husband says, the wife does not want to receive. And you have been at loggerheads and it's become intense in the last three months. I want you to connect your heart by faith to what the Lord is delivering in the house today to deliver yourself from lack of agreement. Agreement is a gift from God and God is asking you today to receive divine agreement by his mercy so that once again you can speak the same language, so that once again your hearts can beat together, so that once again you guys can have visions together, so that once again you guys can hold each other and not be irritated one by the other. The Lord brought you here today that he may mend your relationship for effectiveness and for fruitfulness. Remember, those little ones are watching you. It's time for you to model by agreement an example to them of what it means to be in agreement with each other and with God. Receive your deliverance today in Jesus' name. Let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so what we're going to do very quickly is, um, Kenyatta, thank you. I know that our time is far spent. I would love to pray for everybody individually, but I don't want to ruin a very beautiful Mother's Day with having an extension that um, we didn't agree on prior. So what I would encourage you to do is as many of you as can come here on Tuesday, come here on Tuesday. I would love to pray and prophesy. There's a lot of things that God's been revealing to me lately. So I'm encouraging you to come, not because I want us to have a lot of people. You know, I'm not for that. If a lot of people come, that is fine. I've preached to two people, three people, four people. It don't bother me because I'm always after the presence of God. And the Bible says, wherever two or three are gathered, the Lord is there. I am inviting you to come because God has something to say. And God forbid that the Lord Almighty himself will have a word for you and you choose to listen to bad news on television when you can listen to good news straight from the heart of a loving father. So tonight, I send you away with this word of authority from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this is what he says. He says, love one another as I have loved you. 
if we will make that commitment to stop being judges of one another but lovers of one another if we will be if we will make that commitment to stop being competitors with one another there are couples that compete with one another and their children suffer for it you see there are people who are supposed to be serving in the house of god but they're busy, they're busy competing with one another and the assignment and the mission suffers for it the lord jesus says if you would love one another as i have loved you then you will not fail at anything because love never fails so I send you forth in that charge in the mighty name of Jesus. Communion House, God bless you for your service. The people visiting with us today, thank you for your time and thanks for honoring the invitation. God bless you all. And for some of you, I'll see you on Tuesday, but I hope it is all of you. God bless you.